Welcome to the show. I'm Vivian Birchall, your host. And my special guest today is the State Auditor, Ms. Susan Bump. Welcome to the show, ma'am. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. It is so exciting today to host you because I think it's the first time that I'm uh, hosting our current um, statewide officer. I, is that even the right word? Is it an officer? <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yes, I am a constitutional officer. <laughs> No, uh, and it's more exciting because not many people know what a state auditor does or what the office does. No, so no, that's that's so. So I'm happy for the opportunity to uh, uh, to educate uh, <laughs> a little a little bit and uh, and share my perspectives a, a bit on government uh, as well. Uh, so. The state auditor, it's a rather archaic name. It, the position was created um, back in the mid-19th century. I think if the, if the uh, office were to be created now, that chief accountability officer mm. would be uh, the, the more appropriate title. Um, because auditor implies that we are balancing the books of the <laughs> Commonwealth. Uh, and that's not what the state auditor does in Massachusetts. Um, in Massachusetts, we are focused on, sure, uh, sure how, how money is spent um, and where it's spent, but we're also focused on analyzing state agencies to ensure that they are making proper use of their resources, whether those resources are tax dollars or they are are highway uh, maintenance equipment or they are uh, the programs that the legislature has charged them with implementing. So to make sure that they're staying true to mission and they're properly using their resources and then also understanding helping and helping them understand whether they are operating as effectively mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the citizenry um, or as efficiently as they can. So ca we try to help them uh, figure out where, the, where any breakdowns in their operations may occur and how they may better serve uh, their public. Uh, that's the, the main focus of the office. We also do public uh, benefits fraud investigations mm -hmm. and we also in an office uh, known as the Division of Local Mandates really act as advocates for cities and towns uh, to help them get state government pay for things that state government tells them they need to be doing. Right, I'm going to get to that you know, shortly, but first I wanted to, ha to give an opportunity to our viewers to first get to know you. Who is Susan and how long have you been a state auditor and uh, what uh, prompted you to take this career? Well, I have been in and around government service for my entire professional life. Right out of school, I uh, entered the State House as an intern to a state representative. I then went to work for a state representative, and I served as a state representative for a number of years back in the 80s and into the 90s. Um, I'm a lawyer, so I also was in, in private practice for uh, for years, but came back into state government when Deval Patrick was elected governor. I was Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development, so I was charged with implementing the kinds of policies that I was creating as a, as a legislator. And I've always been a very results-oriented person. Um, and uh, and just so wanted to see things done and done well and done effectively and efficiently. And uh, as much as I loved being the labor secretary, because one of the things that I did was um, oversee our, our state's workforce development, so workforce training programs, and you know, just giving people that kind of opportunity to grow themselves and take better care of their families through mm -hmm. getting better jobs and all. Um, I also saw in the auditor's office an opportunity to, uh, to, to work to address systems in state government that I saw were just missing the mark or they just weren't as equitable as they, as they ought to be. They weren't as accessible to the public as they ought to be. They, they weren't re um, uh, delivering the results 
uh, in really important programs from veteran services to children's services to elder services or even public safety um, that they that they should and so it's that it's that passion for getting it right um, that that drives me um, but also it's just the, the necessity that I see of uh, in a healthy democracy everybody working to build public trust and so accountability I think is a way of a, uh, uh, building public trust to show the, the, the people of the Commonwealth that there is somebody in government who is examining what's going on in government and helping fix um, inefficient uh, uh, systems in state government. That's quite an important role that your office is playing, that you are playing. And you know, just to piggyback off that, what are some of the areas from your experience you've observed where the system seemed broken? Well, uh, I think that one of the most important audits that we conducted, um, and uh, we call these, these are performance audits. How well is an agency uh, fulfilling its mission? had to do, in fact, um, with uh, children who were in state custody because of abuse or neglect in their, in their homes. And once a child enters the foster care mm -hmm. system, um, the state is responsible for uh, their health and safety. And we had previously looked at um, one aspect of the, uh, of the care provided by the Department of children and families and felt that they should be doing more in the way of ensuring that children were getting medical checkups that they needed. Well, we took that idea a step further to find out whether all of the medical care that children were receiving while they were in state custody um, was reflected in the records that the social workers had. So the question is, is the so, are the social workers getting all of the information that they should have about kids whom they have placed with foster parents or in group homes or in other temporary settings? And we, and we found that, um, that they weren't getting all of the information that they, uh, that they needed. Um, there was a whole database of a you know, record of all of the medical treatments that children in state custody are getting because once you're, a child is in state custody, then the state puts them in the mass health program. And so there was this oh, huge body of information that social workers were not aware of. And so there we found that there were children who had been hospitalized for for sexual abuse, for, uh, for broken bones, for stabbings, for, for suicide attempts. Um, and social workers weren't getting all of this information. And so we, uh, we recommended to the agency um, th that they needed to do more information sharing between these programs between the Mass Health Program, which had the record of, of children's um, health care, and the social workers who were trying to you know, is, is, uh, uh, protect the health and safety of children. That is an audit. Um, you know, often when we d conduct an audit, we will find ways to save money. This audit was not about saving money. This audit was about saving children's lives. Um, and, and I think that that's probably the most impactful of the audits that we have done, you know, in a s socially, socially speaking. Well, that is an eye opener. First of all, just uh, understanding the depth with which your office goes to make sure that uh, uh, agencies and people involved are, you know, paying attention to the minor detail of saving children. Right. And which brings me to my next question. That the kind of uh, process you've explained requires a lot of interdepartmental working uh, right. or, or collaborations. Mm -hmm. So in what ways has your office tried to get that, you know, those collaborations going? Well, we don't have enforcement powers. We find, we conduct an audit, we issue recommendations, and then we, uh, we use our powers of persuasion. Um, and also we use uh, allies in the state legislature. Um, all of these 
uh, agencies across state government um, are of, uh, of interest to particular legislators. So we, when we find, when we find problems with the Department of Children and Families, we go to those legislators so that they can back us up mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, uh, and encourage the agency to make the changes that we have recommended. Um, and we also look sometimes to outside um, organizations. Again, every state agency, every state program has a constituency. It yes. has a group of public supporters. And so we do a lot of outreach to those organizations to let them, to hear from them often about what's going wrong with an agency to give us ideas of what we should look at um, when we conduct our audits, but then also to help um, encourage implementation of our recommendations. Um, so there are those outside forces, but the main thing I think that is most effective in encouraging change within an organization is the professionalism and the credibility of what we do in the first place. Um, we are supposed to operate according to standards that are set by the federal government. And those standards are intended to ensure uh, integrity and objectivity in the work that we do. Uh, and so that means asking every possible question, coll collecting every possible source of, of information, no matter where that information resides within state government. And, um, and, and so it's the credibility of our recommendations that, uh, that encourages implementation. Um, it, sometimes, frankly, it, invol it also involves simply embarrassing the agency. <laughs> <laughs> the agency, I mean, when there's a headline, as there was, <laughs> for instance, when we reviewed the Sex Offender Registry Board and found that they had lost track of many registered sex offenders that we were able to find because we consulted the records of other state agencies like the Registry of Motor Vehicles mm -hmm. or the Department of Veterans Services. And so when an agency gets a headline saying that they have lost track of registered sex offenders, that, you know, that, that in and of itself is a powerful motivating um, force for them to make the connections with other state agencies, sister state agencies that could help inform them. Absolutely. And which, uh, we'll get back to the state work later. I wanted to bring it down local okay. because uh, our, many of our viewers might be wondering what the connection is between your office and uh, local municipalities. So. Uh, could you kindly explain what that relationship is? How do you work with local governments? So I mentioned at the outset, there's the division of local mandates in our office. You're yes. statutorily mm -hmm. created. Um, and the, uh, the charge uh, to the division of local mandates is to, um, is to examine the impacts, financial and operational, other um, financial and otherwise of uh, state laws that direct municipalities to undertake certain activities. So what do I mean by that? So when we have um, education reform, uh, the, the state sets new standards. Um, it set new standards, uh, not just for the children, um, and, uh, and their educational attainment, but also for the teachers and for administrators. They had to meet new benchmarks. They had to do more reporting. Um, some of this uh, what, um, required, uh, according to other law that exists, uh, the, uh, the funding yeah. of those activities. Uh, the legislature is not always very good at, at funding the programs that it implements. Um, and so the division of local mandates is there. Uh, we work with municipalities. They come to us and they say, hey, they just passed this law. We have to change every the way we do everything now. Shouldn't the state help us pay for that? And very often the answer is yes. And one of the, one of the most recent examples um, 
actually has been in um, in expanding it's voter voting. access. I was just right? about to ask right? you about yep. that. I mean, yes. During the pandemic, yeah. it necessitated um, a lot of change in the way we vote. We yeah. weren't voting in person anymore, mm -hmm. um, uh, and or we weren't voting in great numbers in person. And so in order to decrease congestion at the ballot box on election day, we spread out the days when you could, we could, vo you could vote. Um, Mail-in ballots. Um, it, it, it all came with costs, some of which the state needed to um, needed to provide to cities and town clerks and and other elections officials. And so, uh, and so indeed, municipalities came to us and they said, "Whoa, the state's got to come up with some money. It if we're going to have to have polling places open for a week." We have to staff them. We have to rent equipment for a week, not a day. We have to have police. We have to have security. We have to do public notifications of this and the like. And so we um, agreed. We found we identified those categories of cost where the state should be paying. Two million and, dollars. Yeah, and <laughs> we, uh, and we uh, yes, uh, two to two million additional dollars to cities and towns um, across the Commonwealth so that they could implement. Um, this change, a very good change, but somebody has to pay for it and it shouldn't be all borne by the local taxpayers. Um, so, so that's an example. We also uh, conduct, look at other reports, uh, or excuse me, other act activities um, that maybe the government isn't required to reimburse communities for, but that are of such cost to communities that the legislature, arguably, should be providing some assistance. And an example of that came a couple of years ago when we looked at police training, municipal police training. Yes. And, uh, and we, we have very high, ha have had very high requirements for, uh, for training of police officers on an annual basis. That was after the police reform? It was before. Oh, okay. It was before, and actually it was, it was months before um, that that event that really brought uh, police uh, the need for police um, reforms in training and in um, in operations uh, uh, to prominence. Uh, obviously, I'm referring to the killing of George Floyd, Floyd. Floyd months before that, we had looked at municipal police training and said the state's not doing enough. And not only are they not doing enough to facilitate the training, but the system that we have. It doesn't really have any enforcement mechanisms. Um, that there's no, there's a requirement, but nobody's seeing to it that police are actually getting the training. Um, and in many communities, they weren't because the town couldn't, couldn't afford it. And there was no process for certifying police and decertifying the police. And so we recommended not only that there be mon more money, but there be changes in the creation of uh, uh, that of a program that exists in most other states, uh, known as the POST system, Peace Officer Standards and Training Program, and we recommended that. And then there was the killing of George Floyd, and then the legislature realized it had to, had to act, and it acted on our recommendations. That was part, it became part of the impetus for, uh, and the solutions for police reform. Absolutely, and uh, the other, one of the, unfunded mandates that uh, municipalities are struggling with is uh, PIFAS, tracking PIFAS yes. levels and treatments. Yes. So now, so far, however, um, so not everything that the state requires a municipality to do has to be funded under the law. Um, I'm not going to go through what all the legal standards are, okay. but basically it comes down to if the state, if a municipality was already supposed to be doing something, like treating their water supply, mm -hmm. um, ke keeping them up to safe safe standards, um, then the state doesn't necessarily have to, to have to step in, um, and uh, and and help them. Um, and I know that PFAS uh, is a, is a real problem that communities are are struggling with uh, because it's very costly to remove that contaminant. From the from the water, um, it is possible that as as solutions for PFAS develop, 
the Division of Local Mandates will be advocating for more municipal funding. Um, and the state already is providing some assistance and, uh, and some of the money from the, uh, from the federal uh, infrastructure and, uh, and even the federal pandemic relief bill known as ARPA mm -hmm. is providing some funding for that, but that's an enormous that's an enormous cost. And there may well be another local mandates report um, on, on that down right. the road. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned upper, uh, you know, the pandemic relief. How is your office auditing that? Well, um, we, in two ways, I guess. So, uh, so we audit every department um, every, every three years. And it's up to us what it is that we audit when we uh, when we go in we could look at this program or that program or or what have you um, so we have an audit plan and what we're doing first of all then is adding to our normal uh, audit objectives our normal you know, set of questions that we're going to ask about a particular agency some particular questions about their their um, ARPA spending um, uh, so it, and, and in this instance, it's mostly about how did you use the money? What did you spend it on? Did you spend it in accordance with the laws, with the requirements of the federal program? But um, we're also making a point of um, addressing one of the aspects of ARPA that is, uh, was called for in the law, which is that the monies that are being expended by all the states in the municipalities um, has to it has to have an equity focus. Mm. So this is to ensure that um, small businesses as well as big businesses gain access to, to relief programs. Um, and black and brown communities as well as white communities. And, uh, and English speaking as well as non-English speaking communities. Um, and so it is to make sure that the programs and the relief that was being offered is accessible to all, um, all groups fairly, um, and then to see what the results are. Uh, did, you, did you design your program so that everyone would benefit? Um, and did you achieve those results? Okay. So that's the equity aspect of, um, of the auditing that we're gonna be doing on, uh, on the pandemic funding. Yeah, thank you for that information. Speaking of funding and uh, budgets and finances for municipal governments, uh, there's been, of course, a, a challenge during the pandemic with, uh, with revenue. And uh, I know th your office has something called, uh, as somebody who works in the land use department, I know that there is land that uh, you know, municipalities cannot yeah. uh, get <laughs> yes. money from. So, yes. and you have this pilot project can yeah. you please explain to our viewers what that is and sure. how it supports municipalities? Well, that is that again was an initiative um, not of our audit off, uh, operation, but from our division of local mandates. Um, I, I, I think it has something to do with the fact that I appointed to run that office a former member of the board of selectmen in Reading. <laughs> so he had. <laughs> <laughs> so he has been a very good, um, very good at, at uh, working with local officials to identify uh, problem um, problem areas and and areas where the state is not making good on its promises. And in this case, we're talking about the promises that the state makes to cities and towns when they take land that had been subject to property tax and they take it off the tax rolls. Um, and use it for, well, for instance, a jail, <laughs> as you have down the road, or, <laughs> <laughs> right, um, or, uh, or, or, uh, or other state facility, or even to create a state park to, put a, a, to, to preserve these lands for recreation and the like. And so under the law, the state has an obligation to make a payment in lieu of taxes to municipalities to compensate them for the for the loss of the property tax revenue that they're going to that they're going to sustain, um, and of course this is all done by law and by formula. And when we looked at it, though, we saw that the formula, um, which is based on property values, was severely disadvantaging 
rural communities, particularly communities in Western Mass where property values have been stagnant or they have been declining. Um, the legislature appropriates a pot of money every year for this purpose. Um, and it, it has remained a static uh, pot of money. It's, it's, been, it's, it's been fixed in size um, for, for years. Uh, it hasn't grown with the property, of values, uh, property values around the state. What's that, what that has meant then is that the communities, probably including Acton, where property values have risen, um, uh, are getting a bigger piece of the pie than the small communities, which in many cases don't have the resources that Acton does to encourage industrial development and commercial development, for instance. And so uh, we, we did this report and pointed that out um, uh, and encouraged the legislature to fully fund this, this program. Um, and you could say that that was a matter of equity as well, because the way they were doing it was disadvantaging the small towns who had no control over what was happening um, within, their, within their borders. They were seeing you know, their populations uh, come east uh, for, the, for jobs, um, you know, for the technology. Um, that is uh, that's afforded here, um, and so we, again, we did this. We did this work, um, and the legislature has uh, has responded, and the pie is now growing for everyone, um, <laughs> particularly the communities that were disadvantaged by the way it was being done before. Absolutely, I mean it's uh, it's such an honor. First of all, having you here explaining what the of what your office does and your divisions within the office, uh, because. As the Office of the State Auditor is not something that regular residents of the, Massach of the Commonwealth think of. No, no, even though every four years my name is <laughs> <laughs> has been on the ballot, um, uh, you're right up there with Governor, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, <laughs> Secretary of State, Attorney General, Treasurer, and then, uh, and then Auditor, uh, elected every four years. I'm, I'm in my third term. So yes. this is my 12th year. This is my last um, year in office. I, I just announced last year that I'm not going to run um, yeah, I was again. going to ask about you. I'm know, not going to run again. Um, you know, as you can tell, it's going to be hard for me to leave because I have great enthusiasm for the job. Um, but it's a four-year commitment, mm -hmm. and I just can't. I just know that in another four years, I'm going to be at a different stage in my life. And, oh. and need to be, uh, yeah, I need to have moved on and give somebody else an opportunity to take this office to an even higher level than I think I've been able to do. You've done amazing, uh, Suzanne, <laughs> and no, you, if you let me s call you Suzanne. Certainly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, speaking of that, what, as voters who are looking for the next state auditor, what should they be, you know, what qualities do we need to find in the next state auditor for it to be very effective and uh, so that we can improve the transparency within our government? I think that the most important um, thing for the office uh, and, and, the, and the, the kind of tone that needs to be set and the culture that needs to be created um, is one of integrity. Mm -hmm. um, it is to work to the highest standards of, of, um, of government auditing, um, which means that you need to be dispassionate and disciplined, um, open to all kinds of information, um, uh, and, uh, and, and very professional about what you're doing. I, th okay. I think that um, you know, this is not a place where you settle political scores. Oh. Um, I get elected, you know, whoever gets elected, gets elected as a member of a party. Yeah. But, but that's the only place, that's the only time when your party affiliation should really be making right. a difference. Because once you get there, um, this is nonpartisan. Right. Um, and you, you, have to, you have to be open to, 
different ways of thinking, different kinds of information. You also have to be really committed to the operation of the office. Mm -hmm. you know, we, have, uh, we have been able to do some of the work that we have done now um, because of the investments that we've made in, um, in IT. In, in our ability to gather information from different state agencies and make sense of it. I mean, that, takes, that takes a lot of, um, of technology. Um, it takes a lot of professional development mm -hmm. amongst the staff so that they can get trained to do, uh, to do this work. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that this is not so much a political job. You want to care about the values that, that people bring to the, uh, to the role. Um, you know, get their understanding of what the public trust means to them, what mm -hmm. accountability means to them. Accountability shouldn't just be uh, pointing a finger at somebody, um, calling them out. Accountability uh, really has to do with how you design your systems uh, and uh, so that they achieve maximum effectiveness uh, on behalf of the of the citizenry. So you're looking for someone with some you know, sophisticated understanding of how government works and someone who can show that they can step back and be above the political fray yeah. um, and rip work on the taxpayers' behalf. It's so great to hear that because we're currently in a, I think, a political climate where everything is just not everything, I shouldn't uh, be an alarmist, but some, in some cases things are falling apart because uh, we're not coming, building that consensus that we no. need. So, I mean, it's been a, a very enlightening conversation with you. Thank and you. I think it's a conversation that our viewers uh, oftentimes do not get. So with that said, is there anything that uh, we have not talked about, about your office and you as a state auditor that you would like our viewers to know? And if there is, uh, speak to them. On that <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I think that what I'd like your viewers to, to know most importantly is how appreciative I have been of the, of the opportunity that you have given me over the course of 12 years to, uh, to serve as your state auditor. Um, I've been really proud to, uh, to work on problems that are, uh, occur uh, in your daily lives, in your uh, encounters with state government. So many people are dependent upon of a wa wide variety of, uh, of state services and to the extent that we have been able to, uh, to help improve the delivery of those services or save money in, uh, in the delivery of those services. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that we've been able to, uh, to do that, that you have placed your trust in me over the past uh, 12 years. Um, it's been an enormously uh, enriching and rewarding experience for me. Well, it, uh, it's been an honor having you on this show again. I can't get tired thank you of for saying being. that. Uh, it's thank you for the, on behalf of the citizenry of the Commonwealth. I'd like to say thank you so much for your service to, uh, you know, keeping us, keeping our government accountable. And I am hoping that you could at least avail yourself to mentor the next <laughs> state auditor <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, you can just build on to what you have done right. um, because I think uh, that institutional memory is something uh, or institutional wealth and knowledge is something that we need right. uh, going forward so keep this pro this going sustainably I mean, we've already started working on tr our transition documents there is so <laughs> much we want people to know absolutely so again thank you so much for being my guest today it's been my pleasure thank you Vivian. and to our viewers thank you for watching till next time